Hey, Bob, thanks for joining me today on the Systems morning, David. Podcast. Um, so the way that I always start this is there's kind of two principles that I have. And one is there's no substitute for passion. So I want to know what you're most passionate about. And then the other principle is uh, what the, the, um, the more you know about something, the more interesting it becomes. So what are you most passionate about and what do you know the most about? I would say <clears throat> I am most passionate about helping people that are um, that maybe lack currently lack access to some of the levers of power and the way the world works leverage uh, complex the le leverage an understanding of how complex systems works and how do you structure language and information in order to um, help them communicate and use their uh, use that new power to to do those things to uh, create value in the world. I really love that as a passion. So first, let me ask, like, what's the story behind that? Like, why is that your passion? And how did you come to that, that realization? Yeah, well, so ac f vocationally, I have a very um, long winding eclectic career started out as an educator, because I really um, had a passion for for children. And uh, I uh, became a follower of Jesus in high school and came to Michigan to go to school. And Michigan had a law that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't homeschool your children, which I thought was kind of absurd. I was like, became a libertarian in, 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 I was a libertarian in high school. I'm not uh, uh, kind of, I wouldn't define myself by any of the current political labels at the, at, at the moment, but, um, in any case, that was sort of a streak. And so I went into education because I wanted to be able to help people educate their children. And I loved children and had, you know, various, you know, sometimes our passions are driven by brokenness. So, it's a, so various things in our lives, you know, lead us to, to, uh, to where we're going. But that was a core thing. That was kind of where the education and children aspect came up, came across. But I wasn't cut out to be a teacher. And so, um, I, I bombed out of teaching and ended up getting into design and graphic design. I was a, a editor of my yearbook in high school. And when the Macintosh came out a couple years later, I was like, oh, this is great. I know how to do this, to do newsletters and do stuff. So I was really a pioneer in desktop publishing and ended up helping teach people how to do desktop publishing. And that's kind of how I got into the technology space. And so I ended up going back to school in the, the U of M School of Information and Library Studies because they were starting to get into digital libraries. It was right around the time the internet was was out in the early 90s. And so I was in that program in 93, and, and that's kind of how I got the, the intersection of, of how technology can uh, be working. And at that moment, I, I, in that program, there were two gentlemen, Lou Rosenfeld and Peter Moraville, who went on to uh, kind of start the field of information architecture as sort of a sub kind of a field within digital experience of so user experience, information architecture, more so as uh, how do you use language to create places and structure the navigation and flow of your websites and your apps and things are really driven by the, the guideposts of the labels, that, that the mental structure that your head creates based on those labels. That's a place that you go and you navigate and you move through. So an information architect works like an architect to help structure those information spaces in order to help do things. And it's highly intertwined with librarianship and knowledge management and organization and how you, how people think about the world. The, the reason so many websites and digital places are, are poor experiences is because they're trying to communicate to lots of different kinds of people and they haven't done the hard work to figure out well, what, what is a shared mental model that all these people have is, and so they come up with a very, they, they think they know how the world works and they only have a very limited lens of the people that are coming. Right. And, and it confuses everybody else. So, mm -hmm. uh, I was in that program in the nineties. That was great. Um, rode the dot com wave understood how you could use and, and, and connect, uh, uh, connect the world have had the privilege of traveling 
uh, globally, both for work and uh, for church-related kinds of things, to spend a lot of time in India. And you, you get to experience, one of the things I've learned over the years is that um, success uh, economically is not uh, necessarily an indicator of a person's intelligence um, or goodness, but certainly in, in any stretch. It, it, it's often uh, just a matter of luck and being in the right place. Because I've met some really lovely, super brilliant people that are hmm. don't have a penny to their name, uh, and then I've met people you. that are, are super there? successful. Yes? Did I lose you? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you froze for uh, a few seconds. Okay, sorry. Oh. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, I, I heard last I heard was that, uh, uh, economic success is not necessarily an indicator of other kinds of success or even goodness of a person. Um, did yeah, I get the yeah, whole it, message? You know, yeah. <laughs> certainly there are intelligent people that get wealthy and there's good people that get wealthy that aren't necessarily sure intelligent, but there's also people that, I mean, uh, the key thing is traveling. You meet a lot of lovely people that are very intelligent and that are very good leaders that would make wonderful executives, but they don't have a penny to their name because they, they, they're not in a, a particular position to, to do that. And then I've worked with plenty of people that, uh, uh, who were very successful and led billion, you know, billion companies that r raised a bunch of money and exited and did their IPO and I would not emulate them. So, yeah. So there's, there's kind of an, an orthogonality between leadership ability, economic success, uh, you know, moral, moral goodness or, or, or that sort of thing. And like you said, you yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't want to emulate them. <laughs> I, that, yeah. That's a very, uh, yeah. uh, kind way of putting it. Um, yeah. cause so they're, along they're on the way, path. you yeah. know, the, the, this to close the loop on the, the passions along the way, I, I, I was a, a science teacher was my science was my kind of core focus in education. So my only co academic degree is a, a science education bachelor's degree in, uh, K through eight certification, but uh, along the way, as the internet came out, trying to understand how this was all working, and and the the you really see in the internet um, and and the World Wide Web this intersection between complicated machines. We've gotten you know we 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 can manage things down to the electron level and move them around and and manage heat and it's all very wonderful. And then it meets people. And there's all kinds of friction, right? There's like these two completely different worlds that are that are in play. And so I watched that and, and struggled with it. And, and I had read James Gleick's book on chaos um, when it first came out uh, a, a number of you know, 20, 30 years ago. So I had a sense of it and, and always had that in my mind. But, but recently, uh, probably the, the past couple of years, um, in terms of the context of this talk and systems thinking, it's been understanding how important uh, complexity and the science of complexity is to understanding how systems interact and work, particularly pe systems of people and how they interact with complicated systems that scientists and software people build. <laughs> yeah, so that that is a universal theme that has emerged in all of the systems thinking interviews that I've conducted now. Um, people are central to understanding systems, all systems, um, managing the complexity, understanding the intersection of human systems with other systems, in this case, internet and other technologies. Um, so before, because I, I definitely want to get into that, um, you know, the, the perspective of information architecture and how do you, what systems you pay attention to and principles and that sort of thing. But there's something that you mentioned that I want to unpack a little bit because this is, al this is also kind of one of the core things that I've noticed about motivations. Um, talking with people about intrinsic motivation, there's often passion. Um, you know, there's no substitute for passion, like I said. But there can be, as far as I can tell, there's two primary uh, genesis for passion. One is just natural love for a thing. So it resonates for whatever reason and you love it. You know, um, like for instance, you, you found that you loved children. Um, and, but then there can also be a reaction to a core wound. And so, um, and you know, you said passion is sometimes driven by brokenness. So what did you, what did you mean by that? Is, and, and how does that figure into understanding people? Oh, well, <laughs> or lack thereof of understanding people. So <clears throat> I'm adopted. So I was, mm. you know, basically, you know, spent nine months in my mother's womb and then was given up 
sat in an adoption agency for three months before my parents got me. I've I've come to realize that there were some some things that happened there that definitely affected me the rest of my life. Uh, suffice to say, my my family of origin that, that, that raised me um, had a, a number of a, a variety of dysfunctions related to alcoholism. Um, so I, I kind of was, particularly as I got into high school, was in something of a broken home. Was ready to get out, but and and so that affects. A, but probably as much as anything, it means I'm not great at actually reading people or gauging people. Um, mm. uh, I, I, I learn to do it, um, but it's not. Um, well. It, Various things get in the way. I'm 60 now, so I've learned. I've gotten a lot better than I was, and so I, I think I'm okay with people now, and and uh, have learned what it takes to um, uh, to engage and and survive. But the, part of it, I guess, for me, one of the things is I'm a, more of an educator than a um, salesperson, if you will. Even though I can be very good at sales through education, but for whatever reason, I it won't try to psychoanalyze it but suffice it to say one of the core kind of motivators for me is i want to enable people to get that aha moment so that they can be empowered themselves i don't want to play on their fears in order to motivate them to do something that i want them to do whether and maybe it's good for them because i mean mm. i think i who would want to have people do something that's not good for them okay fine but but i still i i want to help people uncover their own internal motivations to do things through helping them understand how the world works and with it with a shared goal if you will around that and that's sort of been some of my core drivers for what i love about information architecture because it's all about creating places that help people find where they need to go and do the work they need to do and you do that by creating scaffolding, mental scaffolding of systems, right? You create systems within systems and you understand how people think about those systems and model them in that way. And um, I think that and just my general, uh, I'm a, you know, in the Clifton strengths, I'm data, input, learner, uh, and strategic, uh, or like my top four. So it's just like, okay, give me lots of information. I want to synthesize it, figure out what it means and how to then do you use this? What, what, what good is it? How is it practical? And that's fun for me is figuring out how to help people uh, gain advantage. It's sort of like this AI stuff is very exciting in that um, at the one hand, letting an intelligent machine into your workplace uh, has all kinds of social and psychological re repercussions that you must be very careful. It's like nitroglycerin. But on the other hand, the promise of having every person having their own little intelligent assistant to help them do things um, is a very uh, uh, exciting thing. I think the key is how to figure out how to get it to where the machines are helping people work together. One of the core values of the Understanding Group, the company I, I co-founded and, and run, is that people empower people. One of the things I've learned over the, the years is that there are some, you, you can structure a system to where a very intelligent person or capable being, machine, tool, whatever, is at the center, and everything centers around that, sort of like a star, if you will, and, and optimizes for the center. And um, I've seen people build, you know, a, a good product leader can do that, right? It's like they, they pull it together, they get a great product, and they launch it, and it's great. I don't think that's a sustainable, scalable model. I mm. think getting the person out of the center so that the people on the periphery are all working together toward a shared center. It's not a person. It's not centered on a person. It's centered on the unit that, you know, we have a shared goal. How do we empower each other to work toward that goal? I think that's a much more sustainable structure. And that means getting the intelligent agent out of the center and to the periphery and then figure out how it's helping people work together. But that's not simple because people don't trust the machine. They don't trust each other. There's lots of social dynamic things that companies are going to have to work through uh, in order to, to really excel in today's world. I, I love that perspective and because my, my wife is also a librarian turned product mm. uh, owner. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you speak, speak in my language. Um, but on, in, in the context of understanding people and people systems and information, because like you said, there's, mm -hmm. it sounds like kind of your work 
really is the intersection of two primary things, which is people and then information or the technology around information. Um, yeah, or maybe it, it's how people use language okay. to structure their world. Language creates an infrastructure, right? Laws mm -hmm. are basically language. And how we and, and then we have all kinds of systems to interpret that language, right? And, and it's very dense language, but it's basically language doing work. Mm -hmm. And so information architecture is how you structure language to help you do work is maybe one way to I've never put it that way, but that's a one way to th th think about it in the con but it's it, as you say, it's people, right? Language is mm -hmm. people's most powerful technology. <clears throat> we create it and we morph it and we're so good at it that every time we form a little group, we create our own little language. Mm. Even though we're part of other groups that have a shared language, but our language is a little different, and that's actually where uh, why you need information architecture because you got to figure out how to resolve all those little differences. That I mean, that makes sense. So one, I want to just reiterate or linger on the point that that language <laughs> is that powerful because in the technology mm -hmm. space you have uh, and and sometimes scientific space you have people that prefer math or computer code okay. over language and. There are still plenty of people who unironically believe that that spoken language or, or you know written language is fragile or useless or you know yeah. all kinds of things. And yeah. I understand their perspective, um, yeah. but I do want to reiterate that like everything that you just said about how powerful language yeah. is and how useful it is. Um, I think it's anti-fragile. So, yeah. Okay. Well, why would you use that term? I agree, but I want to understand your perspective there. Yeah. So. Code is complicated, right? I, one of the things I press a lot, of, are you familiar with the, the distinction? I think the, the Kniffin is the framework of like simple, complicated, complex, chaotic. It's sort of like this spectrum of how things can be structured. Mm -hmm. And complicated is, you know, it's following the rules of Newtonian physics. It's a machine that you can build these super complicated machines, but you pull out one little piece and the whole thing comes apart, right? It, it, it's very rigid. And, but, but every time you type six times eight, you get 48. Language is people, the world is complex. We actually, it's really hard to get a machine to operate under Six Sigma, right? Because the world's actually mm. complex. Those screws and everything, they're vibrating. They're not actually fixed. They're vibrating and they're touching each other. And every little vibration touches, right? right? It's a mess. The world is this quivering thing, place. It's not complicated. It's complex. Language is emerged from our ability to deal with complex things and help us deal with complex things. And so language evolves and is fungible. And the things that make it challenging also make it um, resilient in the sense of when you punch it, when you, try, when, when you break language, it doesn't break. You just fix it. It resolves. It heals itself and gets even better, right? We have a disagreement over language. And if we can work through any of the emotional tendencies, then we can resolve that and have a stronger communication bond, right? So it's anti-fragile in the sense of Nicholas Tlaib, whereas something that's strong is fragile, because if you beat on it hard enough, it's just going to break. Whereas something that's anti-fragile actually wants to be challenged, right? Mm. Uh, we, having, having the same speak, right? Always speaking the same words does not create anything. Language needs to be challenged. We need to have conflict and evolve and so forth for it to bring about the beauty that we want from it. So it's, I consider it anti-fragile. I love that. That, that is a, a really succinct way of, of putting it. And so, you know, you mentioned a, a lot of a lot of things kind of center around whether it's a shared narrative, a shared language, um, a shared vision, shared mental framework. So the, there's a lot you've mentioned all these ways that things can be shared. And so it seems like that's kind of central to to part of your work. So how do yeah. you how do you create structures or incentives or systems or train people because education is big? So how do you? Yeah. How do you view that, that, you know, create those shared narratives, create the shared structures or language? Like, how does that yeah. figure into the work that you do? So, uh, to, to the foundation to that answer, when, we, when you first put out your call for, like, systems thinking and how do we use it, <clears throat> the thing that came to mind of how we, we use it a lot is the notion of pace layers, um, that Stuart Brand popularized around the idea that within a complex adaptive system, there are layers that interact within the layer that is moved, and, and, and 
those layers move at different paces. These complex systems have some layers that are moving very quickly and other layers that are moving very slowly. So the foundation of a building, you really don't want to move quickly. It's expensive and you don't want the earth to move, right? But the interior and the, or what's on the menu of a restaurant might evolve very quickly, right? So those are all layers in different systems. And when you want to make a change in one in a fast moving layer, which most which these digital transformation digital initiatives typically are trying to move something think the world's moving fast, we're gonna make a change. The thing one of the things that gets in the way is how the slower layers are operating. You have existing systems in place that are that are doing what they're doing and they were doing it for a good reason. And if you need them to change or you need to change the language or, or, or resolve things, then you, you can't just ignore it. You have to take it into account and you have to understand it. And so a big part of what we do is help make sure that the first, the stakeholders that are, that are behind, that are going to own this place, have alignment about what good means in the context of what's there, making what's implicit explicit. They all have a shared view of their world conceptually, but it's not perfectly aligned. I guarantee it. It's not perfectly aligned. It's, it's, um, they, they may all know their brand messaging and have, and have agreed on that and force that. But beyond that, there's find it in like, oh, well, we have our divisions and our corporate things, but that's not actually how the world works, right? People work in between these things and there's conceptual things that you go to market with that are, uh, it's always fascinating. So we help people, we build models, so the way we, we, we work to resolve that alignment is we listen to people, we observe, we interview them, and then we create models of their world that, that we think they'll all agree with more or less and ask them to critique the models and share the model. And basically that visual depiction that combines both language and position and space and, and conceptual kind of framework is very good for teasing out where people aren't quite perfectly aligned on <clears throat> how the world works. And you get that mm -hmm. alignment. And then the next step is, well, what do we want to do? <clears throat> What's good? And we have some tools for facilitating, <clears throat> excuse me, um, um, how do you balance two good things? So I, I, I want to uh, engage with new people and I want to satisfy the people that are experts and, and power users for my system. Yes, but doing that at the same time is difficult balancing those things. So where do you balance it today? And do you want to change where you want to balance? And any kind of change kind of thing, there's usually after the set of interviews, we'll identify, you know, five to 10 really decisions they need to make on how they want to balance things. And they need to get that out in the open and come up with a structured way to talk about it among themselves. And that's, you know, at the heart of, of, of much of the solution is facilitating good discussions that help them align around language and how they talk about things so that they can then ongoingly solve the problem. That is one, just thank you for like those very incredibly um, succinct and kind of very uh, salient in terms of the way that you expressed all that. So um, a couple, couple points that I want to unpack a little bit more um, is bringing things from implicit to explicit so that goes back to like negotiating meanings, you know, like if there is yeah. misunderstanding or disagreement or misalignment between language, it can be used to resolve those, those okay. differences, whether it's a semantic meaning, a definition, a difference in narrative. And then you also mentioned resolving alignment. So creating models or, or proposing <laughs> models that emerge from different perspectives and then finding um, almost like what I've started to think of as convergence. You kind of converge on mm -hmm. a shared model. You converge on shared yeah. language. And yeah. so then you talked about using structured communication to one, like a series of interviews, kind of what I'm doing to discover systems thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you surface principles through these structured interviews. You yeah. facilitate them. So yeah. let's unpack this structured communication because this is one of the most universal patterns that I found of systems thinking, which is what meetings do you have? Why? What information do you get? How do you conduct the meetings? What are the agendas that you use? And then how mm -hmm. do you distill and synthesize that information? So let's unpack that now, if you if you don't mind. Oh, well. <clears throat> so mostly what I've been t dwelling on is sort of the upfront planning. What does good mean look like, right? The end result is kind of a project charter. And so to get there, you know, the meetings are the core interviews. Really getting at, you know, the, the goal is... Before you start a project, you want to have a clear picture of alignment among the core stakeholders about why we're doing this, 
what's in scope, what is it going to do, what is it not going to do, who is it for, and how we measure success. And so um, that then results in you know a more traditional kind of project charter model, but also this intention modeling where w w when we have a workshop, we facilitate, we have people vote on, well, here's two, here's two things, in, priorities in your world. How do you strike the balance between them today? Everybody vote. It's a distribution. You talk about the distribution. Why is it distributed? Why aren't you perfectly aligned? And there's you help resolve language. And, and you go through a, a series of those. And then you do, where do you want to be tomorrow? Future state. And you, you basically vote and work through it and kind of look at the deltas. And, and so you come out of that with a clear statement of what you want to do and then some decisions of, of the deltas of these things are changing and these things are not. And then the question is, well, who are we doing this for? You've identified that. And so then the, the, the models and decisions get around a, a combination of modeling. What is the existing content? Because there's almost always an existing world that exists that, that we're trying to do. What do we have? How is it structured? And then who are these people? So, so we, we, you do re user research, qualitative research to create models, hypothetical models of um, your users in the world and personas is a real common way that that gets done in the user experience. We've lately, because we're focused as much on the structure of the world as we are on, um, an individual moment, like a marketer might be, this is the scaffolding has to support all the things that happen in this place. And so we look at it, the models we create are around jobs to be done. And we bundle those into what we call archetypes. So clusters of jobs to be done to figure out. So when you go to a website, there's a limited number of kinds of things you want to do. I need to get help is almost always one. But then there's various nuances to the kinds of transactions. I'm trying to understand my world or I'm trying to find something. Or if it's e-commerce site, there's you know more limited. But corporate headquarters, that kind of stuff. There's investors. There's all kinds of ways that, that people use sites that you need to kind of capture. Applications are always different. So... That kind of archetype job to be done is a core model. And then um, the the other models that, that, that we start to create are really high-level clickable prototypes. But these are not, these are really uh, the less detail, the less color. There's no photography. There's very little typography. It's just we want to know is the scaffolding of this world sufficient to help you move around in it to find where you need to go? Because we've identified what we think you want to do. So if we bring you to this place and we give you a list of jobs and we say, look, here's half a dozen things that, that we think you would typically do given you know your recruiting profile. Can you please pick one that you do and use this prototype to see if you can find out where you do it and put your brain on speakerphone and talk us through it. And then we watch people engage with it in order to refine it. And so that's one of the, the, the core. And then, you know, that then gets listed into more formal models of like controlled vocabularies and, and site maps and things that kind of help govern and framework. But often around that, we, we get asked to like big companies uh, all the time have struggled with. I've got multiple divisions. They all want to be on the homepage. They all want to be in the global navigation. They all need to be on the core thing. So help me come up with rules for belonging. Why does something belong in the global navigation? And then and, and just help the organization agree that it's going to rise. It's going to meet these criteria in order to be there. And then within the global navigation is going to have these sections. And within that, this is what's going to be in this section versus that section. And we're going to, as a whole, kind of, holistically do that otherwise it's going to be people are going to put their pieces in the in the parts for their reasons and it's not going to make sense to the end user because the people coming to the mm. site don't know you're getting getting prickly uh, fractally also i apologize uh, you've frozen are, again are we so still i'm just connected? waiting for it to catch up okay there we go um yeah so uh I, one i really appreciate the use of personas and archetypes and i hadn't i hadn't heard archetypes used in the context of clusters of jobs to be done. Yeah, we um, made it so up, talked David. about. So. Sorry, what was that? We made it up. We coined the term oh, okay. in that context. We were trying to come up with what do we call those things. And jobs to be done, you know, they're more tasks than it's... I, I don't think it's there's a straight line from what we say is job to be done is and what Clayton Christensen says is jobs to be done. And so just to be clear, too. So it's, mm. you know, language is fungible. <laughs> right. Right, exactly. So, creating you know, creating that that shared understanding of what do you mean? Um, yeah. Perfect, perfect example. So, you've mentioned scaffolding quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Mental scaffolding, mental places to go. Yep. Um, what are the? How do you characterize? Like, what is what is mental scaffolding? 
Um, and, and, you know, like, how do you, how do you identify or create those places? Because like, again, shared language, I, I have an idea of what that means, but I want to know yeah. what does that mean in your context? Yeah. So I, I'm not as expert at this as some of the people on my team have been, but, um, a lot of the, the science behind what we're talking about is, is embedded cognition, right? And the notion that, you know, your brain is embedded in your body and that thinking and intellect, when you uh, encounter a new place, you're scanning it for information. You're trying to, you're trying to make sense of it, right? The core things that we do is we, we, we pull things out of the, 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 the world, we identify them as objects or things, and we categorize them and associate them and safe or harmful, right? Friend or foe, edible or not. Where can I go here? What are the, you know, follow roads and core things. And so when it comes to digital places, um, you know, we have to provide the equivalent of those signposts and map and guideposts, but also the doors and hallways and windows and things for people to move through because they are, you know, it, we've evolved to move through space. And, and when you give people that opportunity to click through and do it, they, that, it's very natural for them. So then the question mm -hmm. is, well, what are the things that you use to guide people, and it's basically language. It's it's labels, right? The navigation and flow is the the key way. Now you can add to that with headlines and pictures and various other things that you use to give sort of the flavor and the scent of the kinds of place and the feel for it. But at the core essence of it is a scaffolding of uh, that that frames a conceptual space that we hope. When people look at it, right, and, and so we, when we test it, we want to strip away all the other signal to say, does this help you orient and get you where you want to go? Because if it does, then everything else is going to add to it, and it'll only get better from there if, if, mm. unless somebody does something really silly. But if it doesn't, then, yeah, the, the designers and the copywriters, they can try to add context to make it, but they're going to be working against the core, like this is a fragile structure this isn't one that everybody understands well and so getting that to be really usable for everybody is not simple you know we we did work on the ford pass app for ford motor company for their mobile app and um you know over the course of a, a couple projects first before the the uh, battery electric vehicles came out and then after the battery electric vehicles came out really working with consumers and it's you know probably five or six rounds of of interaction with prototypes in order to get something that everybody made sense of and, and made sense of all the kinds of places that, that they want to go. Um, if it's a complex world like that, they, they have a very full featured app. So what are the characteristics of a more resilient or robust, um, scaffolding or, or system or framework versus a fragile one? Uh, cause that's, that's one thing yeah. that I'm curious about is like, is it, because you've mentioned, like, is it is it widely understood? Is it you know, like, if if it if it's if it's understood, if it helps you orient, sounds like those are some principles to follow. But what are what are the characteristics or principles that you use to understand the resilience versus fragility of some of these scaffolding and structures that you're building? Yeah, I, I would say for it to be resilient, it needs two worlds need to intertwine well. <clears throat> the world that creates it behind it. Right, because it's going because that, that's what's going to drive change to it around, it, and it needs to be able to support where they're going, right? So, um, it, you know, the, ideally we don't redo our core navigation and the core way people encounter our our, our world on a regular basis. It it has some some sustenance to do that. It has to anticipate where you're going, and the kinds of things you want to do in that in that world. So you have to get alignment across your your team, if you will, around why this place exists. And then you need to understand uh, how the people that you're trying to serve uh, see the world and what they want to do and what they want to accomplish. And it because it's you're building something complicated, intersecting a complex world, and because the complex world can't be predicted precisely and is evolving and flowing, you probably need to have a, a you, you know to keep it resilient is not just one and done. It's this is an organism. And I'm going to, it's going to evolve. And so I'm going to have to, on some regular basis, evaluate its effectiveness and, and keep getting signal from my customers as, as to how is it working for them. 
and where are they encountering things and certainly to use good you know to test out before you then launch new things is probably the best way you know to have that alignment between your world and mm. their world how do we do that well you 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 just way you do with any language you have a discussion right so is is discussion because that you're touching on some other principles that I find to be pretty universal amongst uh, systems thinkers. One is feedback mm-hmm. and yeah. measurement. So yes. okay. is, and you, you you talked about qualitative data earlier. Yep. You know, like the the kind of the expressed emotions mm-hmm. and other opinions yep. and whatever else that come. So let's unpack the feedback and measurements that apply yeah. in this space. Oh, that's yeah. I think it's where things get very challenging and the, the, there's a, a some fundamental uh, different approaches in the world that you see because as we said um, getting feedback and measurement from a complex system is different than getting feedback and measurement from a complicated system if I'm trying to m- maintain a machine to Six Sigma I have a very defined range of tolerances that I expect it to go in and I can measure that and I can figure out well where do I measure that and if I want to do machine learning on it, I probably ought to measure in multiple places because I don't, I may not know, right? It starts to highlight some of the challenge, which is if you're not measuring the right thing, you're not going to get, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to respond well to it. You're, in fact, your response is going to be poor. And that is the biggest challenge in, in digital user experience kinds of things is figuring out what is the right thing to measure. Does it matter if people come to my site? Uh, or, or click on my LinkedIn pages or, you know, what, what are the, is, is volume all I can measure or can I get deeper into that? Can I understand why people came to, came to my place or why they bought or why they didn't buy? And that gets harder to do. And that's where that bridge between qualitative, where in the end, you kind of have to ask people to self-disclose, right? The only way to truly understand is to get them to try to self-disclose, even realizing then that they don't always tell you what they're, you know, the truth and they're thinking. It's incredibly hard to, to get at. Um, or you figure out some proxy of signals that I do and I try to move those signals and I try to get a correlation of that when this signal goes up, people buy more. So let's do more of that. But, but if you understand that the world is complex, not complicated, you'll realize that, well, that signal is only going to work. It's not going to work forever. The world's going to change. Right. Different signals are come up. And so if I simply rely on it blindly, the, I'm going to go broke and wonder why. Hmm. Well, that that touches on kind of one of the other principles that often comes up, which is evolution, um, Mm -hmm. where you basically have to assume that the environment that you're working in is constantly changing Um, and not just not just the landscape, but all the participants as well and other multivariate things. So how do you manage how do you monitor and manage that complexity where everything is evolving at all times? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of people that kind of A, B test their way to Nirvana is the way I frame it. You know, it's like we just have to go out and just run constant tests and do that. And, and that is a way to constantly probe the, 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 the environment. We are uh, we're focused more on trying to understand what are the core. Like I use the word scaffolding. What are the core forces at work that in the long run matter most to you in this messy, vibrant environment and can we help you and and for us it's helping people construct a a place that people go that they can then find because what's going to change and what's going to evolve constantly is the copy and the content and how i talk about things but where i talk about those things and how my world is constructed ought to be fairly stable or people are not going to get comfortable with it over time or get confused or if it doesn't fit, fit their core thing and so We really try to focus on what are those underlying things that are relatively still, if you will, um, in order to create that place for all the experimentation to occur on the on the edges. There's a couple couple things that I want to unpack. So you talked about like core forces, um, which to me sounds like another way or or as a component of incentives. What like why do people Mm -hmm. want a thing? You know, what is Mm -hmm. what is the motivating factor? But then you also talked about under underlying or underpinning variables that you know may or may not be permanent but they seem to be more durable so how do yeah. you how do you discover those core forces those underlying variables mm-hmm. that are at play and and once you how, how do you discover them and then how do you use them yeah well so um 
the process I described, sort of that upfront strategy discovery program phase, what we're trying to uncover is what are the core motivations of the company? What are the core forces that are, what is the intent of the company? Because companies strategies change, but the assumption is this new place is affecting your existing strategy and you have one and, and, and it's there. So what is it? And those, that should be a force that you want to enforce and maintain. It's like we have this strategy. This is what we're going to try to keep doing. And I want to reinforce that with the, with the structure. And then on the people side of things, it's really understanding what's important to them in the context of this world. What do they need to see? How do they need to see? And, and it really starts getting at, at a minimum, when they come to this place, do we have any signal that they understand it the way we intend them to understand it? Right? I think they're coming to do this. Do they agree with that? And when they do it, it does it work the way they expect it to work? And if I can, if I can get that, that's actually a huge win. When something as simple and fundamental of, uh, 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 of that. When you come to this place, do you know what kind of place it is? Do you know what you can do here? Mm. And then it's a question of the product marketer saying, well, Am I giving them the right things to do? I got them here. They know what to do. Now, do I have good product market fit? Well, that's something that they work on, but we create the place for that to, to occur. Right. So it, it's looking at it as an information landscape. Um, so there's, yeah. so the, it, you know, um, it's, it sounds like some of the most uh, salient signals to pay attention to are importance. Like what, it, what, is, what is the kind of the essential aspect of, a, of an environment? What are the motivations? Can you give me some examples yeah. of some of the motivations and strategies um, and some of the signals that you've mentioned? Because those, those, that's, a, that's a fascinating topic to me. Uh, which, which, on which side of the equation, corporate or, or customer? Or, so. um, or, or either or both or maybe the intersection. Like what is, what is, what is in flight between parties? Yeah. Well, one of the core conflicting things is often – Companies have multiple ways to do things or multiple groups that have overlapping ways uh, that they sometimes compete. And customers, they just see one company. They don't really want to have to know how you're divided or how your product or where you're, right? And so you see this in account structures. Often, you know, multiple, have to have multiple accounts to engage with the company at multiple levels, whether I'm a person or a business or this or that. And yet, and so there's, there's a variety of, it's easier to talk about the mismatches and, and the challenges that people have to face in terms of that. Um, a lot of what we're doing is really balk and tackling. I have a basic set of tasks that I want to do across multiple groups in an organization, and I want them all now to work together. So getting them aligned simply to get their language aligned Mm -hmm. is is a huge step and uh, and having them understand what their motivations are it, it's not so much that there are canonical motivations or things it's just simply every system has a set of them and it generally has people on both sides of it and you have to understand what they all are on both sides and then get them to talk about them the same way to 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 get the language that's going to reflect the the intersection of them less than mm -hmm. particularly out you, you know in it, it's i know it could be frustrating because people they they would want they if they had their druthers a lot of people are like bob can you please just give me like the template like when i was a kid i used to go to i used to enjoy getting uh, architecture books and the the like books of blueprints of house blueprints right for all different kinds of houses and it would have kind of the the, the landscape and the blueprint kind of thing for a house and i would imagine that i could be an architect and architect a house if i just had those blueprints and i would do that all the time that's what i did as a kid it was fun and people want that from websites, right? It's like, well, aren't there standard ways? And yes, within standard, narrow, the more narrow, I mean, one of the things I've, I learned early on around AI is uh, if you want it to work, narrow your expectations. Uh, it's much more likely to, to, to meet your requirements. And the same thing for any kind of template. It's like if you have a very specific kinds of, 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 of site, so people have made a lot of money generating lead gen templates for various kinds of businesses that pay a lot of money for leads. So mortgage industry at one point was a big one, that kind of thing. But most companies have uh, something unique about them. And what they want to focus on in their website is what's 
but differentiates them, not the commonalities. Like we, we actually did a project recently for an architecture firm, and they were one of the premier architecture firms in, in Michigan, and that they have goals to go national, and they had hired an agency, a marketing agency, uh, that specializes in marketing for architecture firms, right? Because there's these common motivations and things, and this is what architecture firms need to do in order to compete. And they came and they did their project and they delivered them. But when they looked at it, it was just a bag of tactics. It didn't really reflect them. And mm. so we had been engaged with them while that was winding up. And, and we're like, you know, we can help you. You can structure your digital place in a way that represents who you are somehow. And, and I, David, I can't tell you specifically how that, how my team translates that. But there's a way of, of basically understanding what's important. What are the mm. key things you want to emphasize? You know, for them, they have, they're have they great storytellers. They have a great portfolio. So how do we structure that in a way that made more sense to people and help them tell their story? And um, it was a much more gratifying experience for them because it wasn't focused on the generic motivations as much as what are the, what are the intrinsic things that make us unique and does that resonate with people? Great. Now we've got a message, you know, we, we, we've got a core message that we can kind of press into that's going to differentiate us. That makes sense. So, you know, I, I've, I've, un, I've noticed throughout my entire career, people do prefer, like, just give me hard and fast rules, right? Just, <laughs> just give me, just give me the, the rule, give me the, the blueprint, the template, however, you know, yeah. um, and I, like, I just want to follow this set of rules, but you know, like you said, if you want something that that narrow, if you want a standard or a single best practice, you have to narrow your expectations or narrow the problem space. And so then you're talking about a few principles and heuristics here, namely novelty. What is what what is a key differentiator? Because uh, you know, human brains pay attention yeah. to novelty, but also storytelling. So it yes. sounds it sounds like you know that novelty signal and the storytelling skill are kind of the two primary. Or two, I don't know if they're primary, but two main disciplines here. Is that is that a fair reading? Yeah, well, it, it's built on a foundation of good basic user experience best practices, right? In terms of how how do you structure a, a world? But then the thing that differentiates is helping people tell their story, right? Which is and 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 hopefully their story is differentiable from the marketplace. Um, we're not marketing. Right? We, we we don't help them come up with that differentiated story. We just help them understand what it is and and what's what makes sense to their world and and how to structure their world uniquely. And then we help them express that. Sorry, I lost you again for a second. Yeah. Um. So what what goes into a good story, or what makes a story a good story or a useful story? Oh, well, now you're pressing into things I want to learn more about myself. My <laughs> my take on it, you know, I'm I'm familiar with Joseph Campbell's mythic story arch, right? So there's there's kind of a core premise around, uh, you know, and and we certainly aspire to this. Our customers are the hero of the story. We're not the hero. The customer is the hero, and and the goal is how do you help them. Uh, understand the problem that they're facing, right? Good stories have problems and core things and there's obstacles and often people try different things. And, you know, in our case, they, they, they try to build their website, the more traditional ways and, and where information architecture comes in later and, and it fails and they don't, and, and they're not satisfied. And so we help them realize that, Oh, you know, there's this invisible scaffolding behind the scenes. Right. And mm. so that's sort of the, right. That, that's always, there's always the, the archetype of like for us, it's an architect or sometimes we're diplomats, you know, it's like, Oh, help me. I've got 12 people that I have to satisfy and none of us are experts. So come and be the expert and kind of be the diplomat, you know, to do that. But you know, a good story has that hero and, and the challenge. And then there's usually some kind of epiphany around what it takes to overcome the challenge. And then often there's other trouble along the way, et cetera. And then <laughs> it resolves. There's a great, I, I can send you after this. One of my team sent, uh, a great little YouTube video of Kurt Vonnegut, who actually, actually outlines this. I mean, I should simply say, you know, I think what makes a good, the best I could tell is it's what that Kurt Vonnegut guy said in that story. And there's these different, there's only a couple different arches, uh, you know, st story arches around that, that underlie most, most stories. But for us, the thing that I guess I should answer, I could answer it a different way, which is to say, the thing that makes a good story is one you hit right from the beginning, which is, it conveys the passion and energy that's authentic from the mm. storyteller or from from the characters within it 
right? That it's an authentic, it's like, oh yeah, I can relate to this because it's real and it makes sense in the context of what we're talking about. And I've had those kinds of experiences and I can come along for the ride, if you will. Uh, that's, I think, helping people get at that and get aligned around that internally is um, an important thing. And companies often struggle with that, you know, confusion. They, they, they get the, it strikes me that they, they get that they need to have good brand identity. Right? They invest mm -hmm. in brand, and everybody has their logo and so forth. But that coherence that you get from that brand could apply all the way down throughout the organization. I look at it kind of like a laser, and you know, lasers are coherent light. And um, all the ways are going up and down and reinforcing each other. So it's very powerful. When I was in high school, we did a holography summer camp, and we used these half milliwatt lasers. And they're like, don't point them in your eye, because half a milliwatt, one two thousandth of a watt, was five times brighter than the sun. And you wouldn't be able to blink fast enough to avoid retinal damage if one of these half milliwatt lasers hit you in the eye. And you think about that, half a milliwatt is five times brighter than the sun. That's mm. the power of coherence. So when we talk at each other and don't align, we're adding friction, incoherence into our messaging. And as soon as we get beyond brand, uh, the world is full of that. Until you get down to the very bowels of the organization and you have your IT diagrams and your ERP that, that nobody can understand. And the challenge is how do you create that shared language and, and, and structure and, and, and view of the world at the operational levels that help you work in an aligned manner, in a coherent manner. So I'm going to throw something at you, and it's sort of tongue-in-cheek, but maybe there's something to it. So if the hero of the story is the customer... Does that mean disharmony is the villain or who is the villain? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yes. The villain is, is the lack of, uh, of coherence, incoherence and, and confusion. Our core tagline is making the complex clear. Mm. Not simple, my, but clear. My tagline for a while um, as a communicator was uh, crystal clear elucidation is my yeah, superpower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've had other systems thinkers say that one of the key signals they're looking to optimize is clarity. So it uh -huh. sounds like di if, if disharmony is the enemy, yes. is the villain of the story, then, then harmony and clarity are the, are the yeah. antidote. That's the, yeah. that's the elixir to seize the sword. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Confusion would be another way to put it. We have a, 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 a good friend, Richard Latham, that, that has a book called The Cost of Confusion. And, you know, if you don't have that clarity, you will have confusion, and there's there's cost associated with that. that. I think that I think that's a wonderful, wonderful place to wind down. This hour has flown by very quickly. Yes. So, any any final thoughts around you know that coherence, the value of of, of you know laser coherence and harmony, yeah, um, or or disharmony? What's what's your what, what's your yeah. magic sword against disharmony? So. We, we talk about this a lot in the context of, of generative AI and, and our belief that the, that the next really where we are putting our emphasis is helping people optimize high value workflows by integrating these machines. And to do that, you need to have harmony across your team. And to do that, we talk about balancing kind of three core things, kind of our ethical management framework. And one is cultivating authentic communication. Um, uh, and well, actually, I guess we start with cultivating human agency, making it clear that, 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 you know, understanding what people's freedom are and, and working that you're, you're working to, uh, opt to, to work with them as part of this organization, not just, uh, you know, that, that, that they're part of that and cultivating that agency and having it be real and then cultivating, uh, authentic communication so that they can really, talk freely around what they think about a, a, a thing, how they view the world, what they're afraid of. Um, you know, a, a, one of the, the, we have a case study we worked on with a group that they got over 200% improvement in the throughput of creating textbooks for um, African countries. They had a grant to create STEM curriculum and they integrated, this is a little over the past year, they started before GP, uh, ChatGPT came out and they got that 
uh, improvement by integrating AI, these little machines at like 20 different steps along the way. And the, they had to overcome the issues of the team. They were afraid that they'd be blamed if the AI was wrong. They'd be afraid they're losing their jobs. There's all kinds of huge dynamic issues that, that are going to be faced in the workforce. You talk about it, you know, in some of your post labor kinds of kinds of things, you know, between here and there, there's going to be a lot of things. And, and the key is that agency cultivating that human, uh, 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 that, that authentic communication, and then looking at whole workflows, being willing to look at the whole system, right? But doing that requires you to really get the whole system. You have to get everybody on board. Everybody has to be honest and transparent about what they're doing. So if you really want to up, you know, change and improve a workflow, you need to get you know, past the, the people that kind of hoard information because they, 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 their job's important, right? I don't want to tell you how to do my job because that's what makes me important. I understand that nobody else can do my job, right? There's all kinds of, you know, uh, pockets of, of, of dynamics that uh, are built into organizations and to overcome those, cultivating that uh, ethical framework for how you facilitate those discussions and how you look at work. We apply Hannah Arendt's uh, framework of action, work, labor to help people think about, well, you know, it used to be we thought machines would take over labor, but actually it can help at every step of the way. So where do we want to use it to help us plan? Where do we want to use it to help us do work? Where do we want to use it to help us automate and do things? Because people sometimes like doing some of those some of those steps that might want to be automated. So why not optimize to let them continue to do that? Because that's where they provide the human in the loop. Because the humans, in the end, it's all about human agency. I mean, personally, I think the the core solution to a lot of these existential threat things is like, uh, in the end, it always gets down to a person. The corporation can't be a person in this case. And there's somebody has to be personally liable for what these machines do. And that way you just keep this like, no, I, can't, I won't let this machine speak for me unless I'm confident it's going to speak something I'm willing to say or it's not going to be harmful. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly appreciate that, the centrality of human agency. Um, I don't know if you saw, I recently wrote an article about economic agency being critical to yeah. sta stability in the future. So, well, Bob, thanks so much for the talk. Yeah. It was incredibly uh, insightful and valuable. So just thank, thank you, you again for jumping on and, and having this chat with me. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it. I look forward to talking again. It's nice meeting Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Sometime soon. Okay, very good. Bye-bye.